Uh, let's get started. It's uh, exactly 2 o'clock. Uh, my name is Bob Shearn. I'd like to start out by introducing myself. Uh, I've been a prosecutor with the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office since the summer of 1967. So that's over 45 years. I retired full time about seven years ago, but I was rehired almost immediately after my official retirement uh, in a part time capacity to do special projects for the office. And uh, believe it or not, my specialty is search warrants and wiretaps. <laughs> I've written uh, books on how to do legal search warrants and legal wiretaps. And to do a wiretap in California under the state statute, uh, the officer has to pass my class, in which I teach them how to do a proper and legal wiretap. So I'm still busy working for the office. And during the time I've been in the office for about 45 years, I've always considered myself an amateur historian. I was always amazed at the um, uh, number of famous and notorious cases handled by the office. In fact, I've got over 20 PowerPoints on cases that I think uh, you've all heard of. Um, you know, some of the more famous and notorious are like O.J. Simpson, Charles Manson, Menendez Brothers, Roman, Pana Roman Polanski. There's just so many of them. But I think of all the cases that I have uh, been involved in or have occurred during my time in the office, Probably the uh, presentation I'm going to give uh, this afternoon has had the greatest impact on society because these other cases were just famous cases. Uh, but the murder of uh, Robert Kennedy, I think, really may have affected the course of history in Los Angeles and in the United States because I think Robert Kennedy had a good chance of becoming the Democratic nominee for president in 1968 and even being elected president in 1968. But that, of course, was uh, uh, made uh, something that wasn't going to happen because of the actions of one man, uh, Sirhan Sirhan. So I'm going to talk to you about the assassination of uh, Robert Kennedy in 1968. I think uh, from looking at the demographics that most of you were around in 1968 and so were many of the major American politicians uh, that were um, alive then and are now pr uh, pretty politically active at the current time. For example, Hillary Clinton. Uh, where do you think Hillary Clinton was in 1968? Here she was at Wellesley College running for student body president. How about John McCain? Where was John McCain in 1968? He is a prisoner of war in uh, Vietnam. Barack Obama. Where was Barack Obama in 1968? He was living in Indonesia with his mother and his stepfather. And how about George W. Bush? In 1968, George W. Bush had just graduated from Yale and was getting ready uh, to join the Texas National Guard. And finally, Mitt Romney. Uh, where was Mitt Romney in 1968? He was in France on a Mormon mission. And uh, here is a uh, photograph he took of himself um, on the beach of France, uh, sending a, a letter to his fiancée, uh, Anne Davies was her name at that time. And uh, when he returned to the United States in 1969, uh, they got married. So 1968, um, you know, our current political figures were around and doing things then. And 1968 was probably uh, one of the most turbulent years in the history of the United States. Um, it involved the assassination of uh, Robert Kennedy by Sirhan Sirhan. And some of the things that were going on in 1968 that made it such a turbulent year, uh, the primary a problem was the Vietnam War. The United States was in a very unpopular war in Vietnam. There was an unpopular draft, and uh, as many as 550,000 troops were deployed by the United States at any one time in Vietnam. There were over 50,000 casualties um, of American troops during the Vietnam War as compared to America's current involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq, in which uh, the most we've had deployed at any one time is about 200,000 soldiers, and the uh, fatalities are between four and 5,000. At the time 
1968, uh, the president was Lyndon B. Johnson, who became president on November 22nd, 1963, uh, when uh, John F. Kennedy, the brother of Robert Kennedy, was assassinated in Dallas. Lyndon Johnson ran for president um, in 1964 and won a four-year term. And in 1968, uh, he was eligible uh, for uh, re-election. And he had not announced his candidacy as of March 1968. And uh, Robert Kennedy, because Johnson was a very unpopular president, decided to announce his intention to run for president, and he did so on March 15, 1968. About two weeks later, on March 31, 1968, Lyndon Johnson made an address to the American people in which he announced that he would not be running uh, for re-election. Some of the other things that happened in 1968, which indicates that it might have been one of the most turbulent years in the history of the United States, was the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th of that year. Um, the uh, Olympics were conducted in Mexico uh, during the summer of 1968, and perhaps the thing that is most remembered from the Mexico City Olympics is the Black Power salute on the victory stand by Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Uh, Tommy Smith won the 200-meter dash in world record time. John Carlos came in third, but people now seem to forget about, you know, the athletic accomplishment and remember more about the black power salute uh, by the two African Americans to protest racial discrimination in the United States. So after Lyndon Johnson indicated that he was not going to run for president, Hubert Humphrey, the sitting vice president, entered the race. Uh, Robert Kennedy had already entered the race, and the peace candidate uh, was Eugene McCarthy. Uh, Robert Kennedy's strategy was that he was going to run in as many primaries as possible, hoping to build a large delegate count that he could use at the Democratic National Convention to take place in August uh, in Chicago of uh, 1968. Uh, Hubert Humphrey was the front runner because he was the sitting vice president and, of course, was the favorite of the uh, Democratic Party. So uh, Robert Kennedy is, campa is campaigning very hard uh, for these electoral delegates uh, that he's going to hope to accumulate for the uh, Democratic National Convention. And California has 174 delegates at stake, and it's winner take all. So if Robert Kennedy can win the California primary, uh, that's going to give him tremendous momentum going into the Democratic National Convention later on that summer. And these are uh, photographs of Robert Kennedy campaigning uh, in California. So the actual primary in California takes place on June 4th, 1968. Uh, the Kennedy headquarters are at the Ambassador Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. That's where the Coconut Grove used to be. They have since torn down the Ambassador Hotel and they replaced it with a uh, series of schools, a primary, a high school, and college. But toward the end of the evening, it's apparent uh, that Robert Kennedy has won uh, the Democratic primary and it's 174 uh, votes. And here he is uh, on the stage at the Ambassador Hotel standing next to his wife, Ethel, uh, announcing his, uh, his victory. And Robert Kennedy had two ways that he could leave the stage um, after announcing his victory. He could just walk off the stage into the crowd, or he could uh, take a back door that was off the stage and walk through the pantry. And at the time, um, there was no Secret Service protection uh, for presidential candidates. Uh, unless you actually were uh, the winner of the primary. So until the uh, person was determined to be the primary winner and actually the candidate for president, um, they did not have Secret Service protection. But Robert Kennedy did have a couple of private security guards that he had hired, as well as some security uh, personnel from the Ambassador Hotel. Uh, but that was it. In any event, uh, Robert Kennedy leaves the stage through this back door, 
and the walks through the pantry. I like to point out that I have spared no expense in the animation uh, that I have. But in any event, as he's walking through the pantry, he's uh, walking next to Carl Euchre, who is a maitre d' at the Ambassador Hotel. They're walking side by side when suddenly someone approaches um, Robert Kennedy and Carl Euchre and starts firing some shots at Robert Kennedy. After the first two or three shots are fired, Carl Euchre is able to grab the arm of the person doing the shooting and the individual continues to fire shots until he empty, empties the eight shots that are in the weapon that he is using. Uh, Robert Kennedy is shot. Uh, there is someone uh, who is a reporter from the Los Angeles Times named Boris Yarrow and he had a camera and he was part of the Kennedy entourage and as soon as Kennedy is shot he starts taking all sorts of pictures with his uh, camera. This is one of the pictures that he took which shows Robert Kennedy on the ground. He's class, uh, clutching some rosemary beads uh, that one of the busboys uh, gave him. Another photograph that was taken, you can see the person, Sirhan Sirhan, although his identity was not known at the time, being detained uh, by various individuals. And uh, you may recognize the person in the foreground. If you're a football fan, you may have heard of Rosie Greer who was a uh, defensive lineman for many years, and uh, Rafer Johnson, uh, who won a gold medal uh, in the decathlon for the United States, was also part of the Kenny entourage. He is not pictured here, but he's one of the persons that helped subdue uh, the gunman. And the person who's standing with his hand up, uh, just on top of uh, Sirhan Sirhan, is a Peter Uberoff. Peter Uroff was part of the Kennedy entourage, and he wound up being the person in charge of the Olympics uh, when they were held in Los Angeles in 1984. So the person who uh, did the shooting is subdued immediately uh, by uh, various people in the Kennedy entourage in the pantry. Robert Kennedy is taken to the hospital. First, he's taken to the Central Receiving Hospital, but they do not have a neurologist available, and Kennedy has suffered some uh, serious head injuries. Uh, so Kennedy is finally transferred to the Good Samaritan Hospital, where he lingers for about 26 hours uh, before finally dying of his injuries without regaining consciousness on June 6th, early in the morning. Um, Robert Kennedy's body was transferred back to New York, and uh, there was a service at St. Patrick's Cathedral in which uh, his brother, uh, Ed Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, uh, gave the eulogy, and this is part of uh, the eulogy that uh, Edward Kennedy gave, a quote from uh, one of the many excellent spe uh, speeches given by his brother. Robert Kennedy initially was buried uh, near his uh, older brother, John Kennedy, although he now has his own uh, gravesite. At the time that uh, Robert Kennedy was shot, uh, his wife, Ethel, was pregnant. And how many children do you think uh, she had at the time she was pregnant uh, with their 11th child? And uh, in December, Rory, a uh, girl, uh, was born to Ethel Kennedy, the uh, 11th child that uh, she bore uh, with uh, Robert. So one of the things a prosecutor likes to do uh, when um, you're prosecuting a case as a prosecutor in court and it's a murder case, uh, many times uh, the jury just hears a name. You know, it's the people versus Joe Smith who killed, you know, um, John Doe. And so the jury just knows a name. They usually don't know that much about the person uh, who has been uh, the murder victim. And one of the things that a prosecutor tries to do is humanize the victim for the jury so they know uh, the grief and the uh, results of the you know, death upon members of uh, the family, you know, how individuals are affected by the death of the victim in the case. And Robert Kennedy of course, was the uh, younger brother of John F. Kennedy. Uh, he was probably John F. Kennedy's greatest confidant. Uh, he helped 
uh, John F. Kennedy win his uh, campaign for senator in Massachusetts and then was the person in charge of uh, John Kennedy's campaign when he was elected president in 1960. And John Kennedy made uh, his brother Robert the attorney general of the United States during his administration. Robert Kennedy made the cover of Time magazine twice. He was a strong proponent of civil rights. Here he's pictured with Martin Luther King Jr. and Cesar Chavez, and also uh, sitting as Attorney General. He was a very aggressive Attorney General, by the way, uh, going after corrupt unions and uh, organized crime. So the theory is that he made many arguments uh, during his tenure as uh, the Attorney General. Robert Kennedy was part of the Kennedy clan uh, in which the patriarch and matriarch were Joe Kennedy and Rose Kennedy. Uh, they had their family estate at Hyannisport and they had nine children, uh, four sons and uh, five daughters. And here they're pictured uh, with uh, Robert Kennedy uh, having the uh, red circle, another family portrait of the uh, Kennedy clan under uh, Joseph and Rose Kennedy. Joseph Kennedy at one time was the ambassador to England and he had very big political um, wishes for his uh, children to accomplish. You know, he had all sorts of aspirations for all his sons to do very well in politics, particularly Joe, uh, the oldest son. But we all remember, at least if you're an American, you remember where you were on November 22nd, 1963, uh, when uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in uh, Dallas, Texas. I was going to law school at the time. I remember it was a Friday morning. Uh, someone came into the class uh, that I was attending in law school and announced that the president had been shot and all of the uh, classes for the rest of the day were to be suspended. It seems that the... Uh, Kennedy brothers, you know, the four brothers of uh, Joan uh, Rose Kennedy were uh, sort of cursed. Uh, the eldest son, Joe Kennedy, uh, was a U.S. Navy pilot. And in 1944, he was undertaking a hazardous mission when his plane exploded in midair and uh, he died as a result. And of course, we know what happened to John Kennedy, who was assassinated in Dallas, and Robert Kennedy who was uh, assassinated in Los Angeles. It seems the only Kennedy brother that really escaped the Kennedy curse was Ed Kennedy, who died uh, a couple of years ago, but he served 46 years in the United States Senate uh, before he passed away. So uh, what about Bobby and Ethel Kennedy? Uh, they were married in 1950. And here are some pictures of uh, the Kennedy family. As I mentioned, there were uh, 10 living children at the time that uh, Robert was assassinated with Ethel pregnant with their 11th child. And what about Sirhan Sirhan? Sirhan Sirhan, the person who was convicted of the murder of Robert Kennedy. He's either just some uh, photographs of uh, Sirhan Sirhan over the years. He's been in continuous custody uh, since June 4th, 1968. He's now, he was born in 1944, so he's about 68 years old uh, right now. Here's a picture of Sirhan Sirhan's family. Uh, he was born in March 1944. Uh, his father, uh, Bashar Sirhan, his mother, Mary Sirhan, and he uh, was one of six children, uh, four brothers and a sister. The family came to the United States in... Uh, the early 1950s, um, although Bashir, after a couple of years, went back to his homeland, leaving Mary alone to raise, at that time, there were four sons. Uh, the girl uh, died of uh, a disease when they were still in Palestine, and the older son uh, died of some wounds and some fighting. But uh, Mary and the uh, four children grow up in Pasadena, a, a suburb of Los Angeles. Sirhan Sirhan attends uh, John Muir High School in Los Angeles. This is the house where they lived. And uh, Sirhan was slight of built, so he had some work as an exercise jockey. Uh, he was once thrown from a horse 
landed on his head and sustained some injuries, which his lawyers later claimed uh, sort of uh, prevented him from thinking that clearly. That was part of his defense, the head injuries he'd sustained as a younger man. Sirhan Sirhan, having been born, you know, um, in the Holy Land, uh, had a hatred for Israel. And you'll see exactly uh, how much and how great that hatred was. He especially resented the United States uh, for having supplied uh, a modern air force to Israel. Uh, if you remember, in 1967, from June 5th to about June 11th, was a six-day war in which three Arab countries, uh, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, invaded Israel. But Israel was able to prevail in just six days because of their superior air force. And it was as a result of the Air Force that uh, Israel uh, won the war so quickly. And uh, Sirhan Sirhan um, hated Robert Kennedy because Robert Kennedy was one of the greatest proponents in the U.S. Senate uh, for the United States, giving this modern um, Air Force jets uh, to Israel. So Sirhan is identified. At the time that he was detained at the Ambassador Hotel, he had no identification on him, and he would not say who he was. But it was then the following morning, of course, that all the papers had Sirhan's picture you know, on the front page, and two of his brothers uh, came to the police department and said, you know, we want to inquire about our brother. And so that's how the police found out who uh, Sirhan was and his identity. As soon as they learned who Sirhan was and where he lived, two of their detectives went to Sirhan's house to search it, and they did not get a search warrant. But they go to the house, just go right to Sir Han's bedroom, uh, search his bedroom, and find all sorts of incriminating evidence. You know, notes that he wrote that he was going to uh, assassinate uh, Robert Kennedy. So one of the big issues in the trial was, uh, was this evidence that people could use uh, if the prosecution had obtained it without getting a search warrant and just conducting a warrantless search. But the uh, case is filed. This slide shows the main characters in the trial, the judge, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, and the charges. There was uh, one count of murder, uh, with the victim being Robert Kennedy, and five additional counts. As Sirhan kept firing the gun, some of the bullets struck uh, some other individuals in the pantry. Uh, none of them died as a result of their injuries, even though one was struck in the head with a bullet. Uh, she survived. So uh, for the five additional victims, all of who survived, Sirhan is charged and counts two through six with assault with a deadly weapon. So one count of murder and five counts of assault with a deadly weapon that he's charged with. Uh, this is the prosecution team uh, that was assigned to prosecute the case. And uh, naturally, the bosses are sitting down, and the three prosecutors are standing up. I joined the office in 1967, so I'd been a DA a year already uh, when uh, this case was being tried by uh, the district attorney's office. And when I joined the DA's office, the number two man in the office, just behind the DA, was someone named uh, Lynn, and his nickname was Buck Compton, the man standing at the left. And he was the primary prosecutor in the case. And he was assisted by John Howard and uh, Dave Fitz, both of whom were outstanding trial lawyers in their own right. And uh, the one person I want to talk about is Buck Compton, because uh, I think that in the history of the LA County DA's office, uh, the greatest person we've ever had as a lawyer uh, or a member of the office was Buck Compton. Not just what he did in the office, but his other lifetime achievements. Uh, first of all, he went to UCLA in 1938. Uh, in 1939, he was one of their star athletes. He was a catcher on the baseball team and an uh, all-conference lineman on the football team. And one of his teammates in both sports was Jackie Robinson. But after you know, uh, World War II starts, he uh, joins the Army and... Uh, becomes a member of um, the 2nd Battalion in the European Theater. 
And I don't know if you uh, have ever seen a TV series called Band of Brothers about a group of American soldiers that are fighting on the uh, European front. Well, this is uh, based on the company of which uh, Buck Compton was a member. And if you one, watch some of the episodes, uh, at the end they'll have the credits and they'll say, you know, Lynn Buck Compton played by so-and-so. He was actually one of the named characters in Band of Brothers. And there's one episode I saw where there's a fleeing German soldier and Buck Compton's character is seen throwing a hand grenade at the soldier which explodes upon impact. And the other soldiers say, yeah, that's Buck Compton, our baseball player. But uh, after the war, and uh, Buck is awarded you know, all sorts of medals for his uh, performance as a soldier, including a Silver Star, Purple Heart, a Victory Medal, etc., he uh, joins the Los Angeles Police Department and uh, becomes a detective for the uh, LAPD. But he's going to law school at night and uh, decides to join the DA's office in 1951. And after he joins the DA's office, he's able to rise uh, through the office until he becomes the number two person in the office. Only the district attorney at that time, Evel Younger, who was an elected official, was a higher person in the office uh, than Buck Compton. And uh, when I joined the office in uh, 67, uh, Buck Compton at that time was the chief deputy, basically the person in charge of um, running the office. And in 1970, you know, a year after uh, Sirhan was convicted, uh, Buck Compton was appointed to the appellate court, and for 20 years, from 1970 to 1990, he served as a justice on the California Court of Appeal. And I regret to inform that uh, he died in February of this year uh, at the age of 90. Uh, this was the defense team. And uh, the person leading the defense team was Grant Cooper, the person depicted in the middle. Uh, Grant Cooper was probably one of the excellent defense lawyers. Uh, Sirhan could not afford uh, a defense attorney. And uh, the court system made sure that he would be represented by as good a trial team as possible. And he actually had three lawyers assigned to defend him, just like the prosecution assigned three lawyers to handle the case. Uh, Grant Cooper was the president of the Bar Association at one time, and uh, in the early 1940s, uh, or mid-1940s, about 1943 to 1945, he had been a member of the DA's office, and he was the chief deputy in the DA's office um, in the early 1940s, the same position that Buck Compton held. The judge was a no-nonsense judge, you tell that just by looking at him. Uh, who had served in the Navy and um, became a judge in 1953 through 69. The uh, Sirhan case was one of the last cases that he handled. But he also had been a member of the DA's office. And from 1943 to 1945, he was the chief deputy running the DA's office. So you have the unusual situation where all three main legal uh, persons in the trial, the judge, the uh, main prosecutor, and the defense lawyer, were all the chief deputy at one time of the district attorney's office. Um, when you are in a trial as a prosecutor, usually there are uh, three phases. And in uh, the Sirhan case, you know, this was a typical criminal trial. You know, in phase one, the prosecution puts on their evidence, and uh, these are, you know, um, basically the evidence that uh, was put on. Um, rather than read everything, uh, this was really a pretty strong case showing that Sirhan Sirhan had shot Robert Kennedy because Carl Eucher is standing right next to Kennedy when the shots are taking place. Uh, um, Sirhan is disarmed and the gun in his hand turns out to be the murder weapon. I mean, that's a case that even I could try. The um, second phase is where the defense uh, presents whatever defense or feel is uh, available to them. And in this particular case, they conceded that uh, Sirhan had shot Robert Kennedy. But they claimed that he was uh, so mentally incapacitated from various things that he really couldn't appreciate the nature of what he was doing. And he was only guilty of either second degree murder or manslaughter. And the prosecution was seeking a first degree murder conviction because they wanted the death penalty 
and the death penalty is only available in California if the uh, defendant is convicted of first-degree murder. So a second-degree murder conviction would be quite a victory uh, for the defense. And of course, the third phase is when the prosecution gets to introduce rebuttal evidence to overcome whatever inferences the uh, defense has asked the jury to infer from um, the presentation of their evidence. We are now going to jump 30 minutes. Yeah, Actually, 2.30 becomes 3, but anyway. You know what, the people aren't aware of that the prosecution and the defense reached an agreement to settle the case. And the deal that the uh, prosecution and defense attorneys reached with Sirhan's approval was that Sirhan would plead guilty to first degree murder and receive a life sentence and be spared the death penalty. And that was the deal that the uh, prosecution and defense had reached. And normally when the uh, attorneys in a case reach a deal to settle a case, the judge will just rubber stamp it. And, um, you know, the attorneys went to court and told Judge Walker that they had reached a disposition to the case. And Judge Walker seemed to be sort of skeptical. And he asked Sirhan, who's in court, you've got to give me a reason before you can plead guilty. And the Sirhan says, on the record, in open court, I killed Robert Kennedy willfully, premeditatively, with 20 years of malice aforethought. That is why. And um, Judge Walker said, I'm not accepting the plea. He says, I want a full public hearing as to what the evidence is in this case, because uh, I've known previous uh, cases where there's been a murder or assassination of a political figure and there was no trial. There's always questions that the public has. So I want a full trial in which all the evidence is presented in open court. So he required that the uh, parties go to trial in this particular case. I mentioned that there was a warrantless search of Sirhan's bedroom um, the day he was arrested when the officers went and searched his room uh, without a search warrant. And uh, these are some of the things they found during the search of Sirhan's bedroom without getting a warrant. Uh, first, they found an envelope with Sirhan's handwriting that says RFK must be disposed of like his brother was. Then there were two notebooks um, in his handwriting with had various notations about RFK must die. And uh, Here's one, May 18th, you know, just three weeks before uh, June 4th when uh, Robert Kennedy was shot, where Sirhan writes in his own handwriting, my determination to eliminate RFK is becoming more and more an unshakable obsession. And finally, uh, another page from his notebook where he writes over and over and over again, RFK must be assassinated, RFK must die. Then at the bottom, you know, um, uh, Robert is going to die, Sirhan, Sirhan. Um, so, you know, this is pretty powerful evidence. And uh, let's say that you're a prosecutor, and uh, you know that uh, the police have obtained this incredibly powerful evidence to show all this premeditation and deliberation on the part of Sirhan, which will versically you know, clinch your first degree murder conviction. But you also know that it was uh, seized without getting a search warrant and may be illegally obtained evidence. So as a prosecutor, do you use that evidence or do you hope that the other evidence is sufficient and that you can get a conviction without using uh, these notations? Well, um, as a prosecutor, I can tell you that you never hold back. You use whatever evidence you have and let the appellate lawyers worry about the appeal later on. And that's what the uh, prosecution did in this case. They introduced all these documents uh, so that the jury was aware that Sirhan had been considering um, killing uh, Robert Kennedy for quite some time before the actual act took place. Uh, the actual trial is conducted and probably the key witness it was Carl Eucher, you know, the major d' at the hotel who was standing next to uh, Robert Kennedy when the shots were fired.
just shows the position of the various uh, persons at the time the shots were fired by the ice machine in the pantry. You know, I mentioned that there were eight bullets uh, that were fired from um, the uh, gun that was used uh, to shoot uh, Robert Kennedy. And the uh, ballistics expert was Dwayne Wolfer from the Los Angeles Police Department. And he tried to make sure that people would feel there was not a conspiracy, that just one gun was used in the assassination. And uh, he tried to account for uh, all eight bullets that were fired. And some of the trajectories of the bullets, it's like they had the life of their own. Like, um, look at bullet number six. It passed through uh, one person's pants leg, struck the cement floor, and then ricocheted into some other person's leg. Um, bullet eight reflected off the ceiling and struck someone in the head. So it's not like these persons were struck directly by the shots fired. Uh, Dwayne Wolfer had to show that there were all sorts of ricochets and uh, you know, uh, changes of movement of some of the bullets that were fired from the gun in order to um, indicate that uh, he could account for all eight bullets that were fired. And this is a picture of Dwayne Wolfer, the criminalist, uh, Dwayne Wolfer is shown here looking at a door jam, which appears to have two bullet holes. You know, something that apparently he thought was important. It's a close-up of the two bullet holes in the door jam, which were not bullets that were counted for in Dwayne Wolfer's testimony. And Thomas Noguchi, who was the coroner, who also went to the scene, also seems to be interested in these uh, two what appear bullet holes in the door jam. Uh, in any event, the L.A. Police Crime Lab uh, took the door jam to their lab, conducted various tests on it, and decided it did not have any value of e as evidence and just destroyed the door jam. So that is something that was and is no longer available. And this is a diagram used by the prosecution to show the trajectories of the uh, various bullets, you know, ricocheting some off the wall, some off one person into another. The autopsy was performed by uh, Dr. Thomas Noguchi, the so-called coroner to the stars. Uh, he performed autopsies on uh, celebrities whenever they came through the coroner's office. He was in charge and he uh, liked to do the um, autopsies on the um, famous figures coming through the office. In addition to Robert Kennedy, he did autopsies on Marilyn Monroe, Sharon Tate, William Holden, I think Janis Joplin, but it seemed whenever someone I came through the office uh, that was well known. He wanted to do the autopsy. And uh, he determined that the actual bullet uh, that killed Robert Kennedy was one that actually entered in the uh, back of the neck, fragmented upon impact, and, um, you know, uh, rested in uh, the brain stem. And this is a diagram that shows the entry of the various bullets, one in the back of the neck and two in the lower right shoulder area. So Sirhan uh, was putting on a diminished capacity defense. And usually a defendant will not testify in his trial. You hear all about these trials in notorious. It's very rare that someone takes the witness stand. But um, Sirhan actually did testify. He said he went to the Ambassador Hotel and then he has no memory of anything happening after that. The next thing he knows is that he's being pummeled by these people, you know, in the pantry. And uh, one of the troubles is when you testify, you can be cross-examined by the other side. And here the prosecution had all sorts of good stuff to cross-examine Sirhan about. About the notebooks in his bedroom that he hated Robert Kennedy, that he had said Robert Kennedy must try, that he was going to kill Robert Kennedy. Uh, he had to admit that he had gone to a target range that afternoon to practice firing his gun. He had to admit that when he tried to plead guilty, uh, he said he shot Robert Kennedy with uh, premeditation and uh, deliberation. Judge Walker allowed the prosecution to use that statement uh, that Sirhan made in open court. So you can see that uh, there was probably um, you know, much more um, that the prosecution got out of Sirhan testifying than Sirhan did, based on all the information and evidence they could uh, retrieve from Sirhan during the cross-examination. 
But Sirhan did have eight experts who were able to testify that uh, Sirhan um, was in a dissociated mental state at the time of the shooting and that uh, he was being truthful when he said he didn't remember anything that happened at the time of the shooting. The prosecution had a rebuttal witness, one witness who said, yes, uh, I think that Sirhan uh, is suffering from mental disease, but that he knew what he was doing. And in California, you can be crazy as a loon, but as long as you know what you're doing and understand the consequences of your actions, uh, you do not have a um, defense to a crime of murder. It's got to be uh, something more. Uh, you have to really not understand uh, what you're doing is uh, unlawful. So the closing arguments, defense uh, counsel wanted Sirhan to be convicted of second-degree murder. Prosecution said, no, this is a first-degree murder case based on all the evidence we have uh, to show deliberation and premeditation. This slide uh, just shows uh, the... Uh, faces of the persons who were victims in the various counts, you know, puts a face to the various accounts uh, that Sirhan was charged with. And the trial result lasted about uh, just less than four months. And Sirhan is convicted of first degree murder and in a separate proceeding he's given the death penalty. So uh, post-trial, uh, the judge in California can write to the adult authority, the state prison officials, to give them their opinion of the case. And here you can see that Judge Walker writes a very powerful statement uh, to the uh, state prison people to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, Sirhan Sirhan uh, stays in jail and people know uh, the seriousness of the uh, crime that he committed. He talks about the notebooks in particular in his statement to the adult authority. You probably know that Sirhan um, was not executed. In 1972, the California Supreme Court uh, voided all the death penalty censuses in uh, California. Uh, there were about 107 people on death row at the time, and all the people on death row had their sentences reduced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole. Uh, because with the death penalty no longer available as a penalty, uh, the sentence reverted to what then would be the most serious punishment after the death penalty. And California at that time did not have life without parole. Their most serious punishment was life with parole. So all the people who've had their death penalty sentences reversed, including Sirhan Sirhan, Charles Manson, and the members of his family, uh, the Onion Field Killers, uh, all their sentences are reduced to life with the possibility of parole. You know, did Sirhan act alone? Um, my feeling is that he did act alone. Uh, there's 77 persons in the pantry. No one saw a second gunman. He's caught in the act, uh, disarmed by witnesses, and his personal notebook showed that he was working by himself in his determination uh, to uh, kill Robert Kennedy. And he has admitted the shooting, and he's never implicated anyone else. Uh, persons who um, rely on the conspiracy theory say, well, how come he was shot in the back? The witnesses all say that uh, the gunman, Sirhan, approached him from the front, yet he has three entrance wounds to his back. Well, uh, the witnesses also say that Robert Kennedy saw this man with a gun approaching him and in a reflexive action turned his body uh, to the side as he was being shot, and that explains why the bullets entered you know, from his back instead of his front. Um, the conspiracy theorists talk about the uh, door jam with the two bullet holes in it, but to me that's a uh, stalemate because uh, we don't have that evidence. We don't know what it could show. We have to rely on the criminalist at LAPD that said they did conduct tests on it and it had no evidentiary value in the uh, Sirhan case. And finally, Sirhan was seen with a woman in a polka dot dress and uh, he, as it turned out, he was not really with the woman, he was just near the woman. A couple of epilogues. The um, conviction was appealed, and this is the uh, first page of the decision. Probably can't read what I've underlined, 
but basically the California Supreme Court ruled that the warrantless search of uh, Sir Han's bedroom was proper under an emergency theory. If there's an emergency, you don't have to get a search warrant. And they said the emergency could have been that there was a conspiracy to kill other uh, political leaders besides Robert Kennedy. And therefore, it was essential to conduct a search of Sir Han's room as soon as possible, which negated the requirement of getting a warrant uh, to search a room. So they've uh, upheld the um, search of Sir Han's bedroom. And now we have a rule of law in California that says if a political leader is assassinated, you can search that guy's bedroom without a warrant. It's never happened since then, but at least uh, they made the ruling uh, appropriate for this particular case. Okay, Sirhan has now had his murder conviction um, and sentence reduced to life with a possibility of parole. So now he can come up before the parole board and has to be paroled. And the Jerry Brown, who was a governor in California at, uh, at the time, actually afterwards, because uh, you're not allowed to apply for parole on a first degree murder until you've done seven years. So about 1975, Sirhan is eligible to apply for parole. Jerry Brown, who is now governor of California at age 70, 72, he was also governor of California 40 some odd years ago when he was in his 30s. And he uh, did not believe, uh, or he believed that uh, parole was appropriate for persons convicted of murder, because he felt that murder was a situational type crime. And if you uh, remove the person from that situation and parole them, uh, they would be uh, safe bets to behave legally uh, when they were paroled. And the shortly after he becomes governor, there is a directive which is sent to the various parole boards in California. And the uh, directive says that every effort will be made to establish parole and discharge dates the first time an inmate appears for his regularly scheduled parole hearing. And uh, Sir Han is one of the first people uh, to have his uh, parole hearing. He's not done seven years. And sure enough, uh, he's granted a parole. He's got a hearing, um, looking at these dates. Uh, this is actually the handwritten notes of the parole board uh, that uh, heard his parole hearing. And you can see at the bottom that they grant his parole and that it is set for sometime in 1985, I believe it is. Oh, there it is, okay. Uh, his parole date is set for February 23rd, 1986. So he's got to do another 11 years uh, after he's uh, given a parole date, 11 years in the future. So he's arrested in, you know, uh, 1968. He'll have done less than 18 years uh, for the assassination of Robert Kennedy if uh, this parole goes through. But uh, as the parole date approaches, uh, there is public outcry about Sirhan Sirhan release, being released on parole. So we have a DA named John Vandekamp who decides that he's going to fight Sirhan's release. Larry Trapp, a deputy DA, is assigned to go to the parole board and petition for Sirhan's parole to be rescinded. And in fact, after there is a hearing, uh, Sirhan's parole date is rescinded. We're able to introduce all sorts of evidence showing that Sirhan had been a very poor prisoner, had often threatened some of the guards, and uh, based on that, um, the prosecution was able to convince the parole board that Sirhan was not a suitable candidate for parole. So his parole date is rescinded. And uh, this is a newspaper article uh, from uh, March, I think it's 2011, in which uh, Sirhan had his uh, most recent uh, parole hearing he was denied parole again, I think for the 13th time, and his next parole hearing is set from five years from the date of the previous hearing. So it's gonna be another four years or so before he gets another parole hearing. And the Sirhan, of course, um, as I indicated, is 68 years old, so he'll be well into his 70s before he has another parole hearing. Just to close out, just uh, what happened to some of the persons who are involved in this particular case. You know, Sirhan is still in custody. Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., I see on television periodically. Uh, he's got the raspy voice that talks about environmental issues. T 
talk about Ethel Kennedy a little more in a slide or two. The Ambassador Hotel has been demolished. It's now been replaced by an educational complex. And uh, to me, this is a very interesting slide. I don't know if you saw about a month ago, there was on television a documentary about Ethel Kennedy. Ethel Kennedy is 84 years old, and she has never agreed to be interviewed uh, since her husband was assassinated, never been remarried. She just lives at the family estate in Hyannisport. But the girl she was pregnant with when her husband died is Rory. And Rory has made a career of doing documentaries and doing work on television. So she talked to her mother and said, Mom, for the sake of history, would you let me interview you? I'm your daughter. I'm not going to do anything to really embarrass you. And Ethel says, OK. And there was a wonderful documentary. It was on HBO in the United States about a month ago. And they just talk about uh, Ethel's life. There was one very touching moment in the interview when Rory tries to ask her mother about what happened the night of June 4th. Uh, 1968, and Ethel starts to answer, and her voice catches and says, I can't answer. Please ask me something else. It was just very touching. But anyway, uh, that's Rory, uh, the uh, daughter that she was pregnant with, her 11th child, um, when uh, her husband was assassinated. You know, we still have the uh, terrible problems uh, between, you know, Israel and the uh, Palestinians that exist uh, just as serious now as they existed, uh, you know, 40 some odd years ago. And there's just a couple of uh, final slides. Who did Bobby and Ethel have dinner with the night before? Well, you know, they were in Los Angeles and they uh, had a dinner where they enter were entertained by num numerous persons from uh, the Hollywood industry. And two of the persons that attended the dinner were uh, Sharon Tate and Roman Pulaski. And a year later, Sharon Tate uh, died at the hands of uh, members of the Manson family. Oh, I should always discuss uh, Robert Kennedy's relationship with Marilyn Monroe. I mentioned this yesterday, but uh, basically what I think the true story is that uh, Robert Kennedy was in fact having an affair with Marilyn Monroe. When he came to Los Angeles, he would stay at his brother-in-law, Peter Lawford's house in Santa Monica. Marilyn would meet him at that house, and that's where they would um, continue their relationship. Although eventually, J. Edgar Hoover told, uh, Rob, told John Kennedy that he was jeopardizing his career um, by having a relationship with Marilyn. So John sent his brother Bobby to Marilyn to tell him that the relationship was over, and he did, and they started their own relationship. Well, you know, there is some speculation that Bobby Kennedy may have been involved somehow in Marilyn's death. He was known to be in San Francisco the evening that the Marilyn Monroe uh, died, and uh, some people claim they actually saw him in Los Angeles that evening. But I don't think there's ever been uh, real concrete evidence that he had anything to do with Marilyn Monroe's death. So Robert Francis Kennedy uh, lived a very full life. He died when he was just 42 years old. And uh, I think that he had a very good chance of being a president of the United States, uh, but for the actions of uh, Sirhan Sirhan. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for attending. And one last thing, I'll be giving another lecture tomorrow on uh, the stalking of Madonna. You know, uh, what happened in their Madonna case and how laws were, ena were enacted to protect Madonna and other members of, uh, you know, the Hollywood community. So thank you.